maybe I'll kick us off there and just do a quick little intro sure. and I'll get you going. All right, good morning, everyone. I know some people are still getting their food, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so we have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So just really happy to be here uh, introducing our colleague from Lifomic, Dr. Ben Salisbury. Um, so the folks at Lifomic, as you know, have been working with us very closely on um, this Precision Health Initiative uh, Grand Challenge that um, came out of the IU Grand Challenge initiatives. Um, we've been doing a lot of work together uh, on development and deployment of the informatics platform to enable Precision Health, and I know Ben will talk a bit about that. <clears throat> Just a little bit about Ben. So he's a computational biologist by training, actually did his uh, uh, undergraduate training at Yale, receives his PhD from the U University of Michigan, and then he returned to Yale for a couple of years as a postdoctoral researcher before moving to industry in 2001. He's a 17-year veteran of the precision medicine industry, been doing this work for quite some time, um, working for about an 11-year period with a company called uh, Genesance on uh, uh, a number of contributions there, including in population genetics, statistical genetics, helping bring novel antidepressants uh, to, uh, uh, to genetics and statistical genetics, and, and ultimately helping bring novel um, uh, drugs like antidepressants to market. Um, has has now been with Lifomic for how long? Uh, three months. Three months. So so relatively new to Lifomic, but certainly not new to the industry. And so when we were talking, we were just having a conversation about this again. Um, we've been talking a bit with our, our friends and colleagues at Lifomic about how we can work even more closely together. Clearly, we have this precision health initiative that's a, a focus of attention. But part of the reason why we wanted to have this whip dedicated to the work that's happening at Lifomic is because I think there's so many more opportunities for us to be able to work together. What we do in the applied research space, how we take solutions that have great potential for impacting health and actually bring them to the clinical environment, bring them to otherwise to, the, to, to our patients and to the public and demonstrate uh, and develop evidence for their value and how they can actually impact health. That's what we do. And of course, uh, our colleagues at Lifomic are really expert at uh, developing such solutions. And so there's an obvious partnership there that could lead to not only some um, pilot projects potentially, but even grant opportunities and the like that we should be doing together. So keep that in mind as you're listening to today's presentation and hopefully it'll get your thoughts flowing on the kinds of things we could be doing together. And with that, I will turn it over to Ben. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you all for coming out today. I'm pleased to be sharing the, the progress we've been making working with uh, Regan Streif. Um, so I will start this off by a little bit of introduction to the company, talk about uh, the Precision Health Initiative that we're working, uh, working on together, and uh, some more details about the, uh, the platform and tools we've been building, and go into a live demo. So we'll uh, see whether the demo demons are, are active today. I, I think I have them under control. So, Lifeomic is a young company. We have uh, only were founded a year ago in January, so here we are at, at 15 months. So I've only been with the company for three, but uh, I'm starting to be an old hand at this point. So uh, who, who are we? We're a little over 40 people at this point, uh, most of whom are, are developers, so software engineers, uh, back-end, front-end, mobile developers. Uh, we have a bunch of scientists on staff, so several geneticists, bioinformatician, and uh, a large team of security experts. We see that as kind of fundamental to operating on the cloud, especially if you're going to deal with you know, medical data. And uh, our core competencies, so a lot of the staff uh, came with our founding, our, our CEO, Don Brown, who uh, is uh, well known in the Indiana, uh, Indianapolis business community, uh, founded multiple companies. Uh, a large one called Interactive Intelligence was at its, at its peak before, he, uh, before they sold uh, a, couple, a couple of years ago at over 2,000 people um, spread across multiple states. And they had built one of the largest uh, cloud uh, implementations of, of, of any kind out there, uh, running call centers around the world. So uh, they, the staff uh, that came into us from uh, Interactive uh, have a lot of experience in architecting these robust systems that are obviously very scalable uh, and uh, can be deployed worldwide uh, using machine learning and other tools uh, like those to improve the systems and as, as tools for research. 
the security I mentioned, and of course, that we have an emphasis on genomics. Uh, the omic in life omic has to do with uh, genomics and proteomics and metabolomics, uh, all of the lo lovely uh, big data that we uh, like to think of in uh, biomedicine today. And uh, the mobile development, which I'll definitely touch on later. Uh, so we are already spread out into three states. So we have offices uh, just a few blocks down on 10th Street here in Indianapolis and uh, also down in RTP, North Carolina and out in Salt Lake City. And, uh, but we're uh, working well together and having fun working with you guys. So uh, the problem, like I said, that we're kind of set out to solve is, is how to address taking those, that, those tools, that toolkit, this know-how on how to do this enterprise uh, engineering uh, and applying it to genomics. Uh, so taking these massive data sets and being able to put them together with clinical information coming from multiple sources and, uh, and doing this in a cost-effective way so that you can store the data, manage the data, access the data. Uh, so you don't have to be, as an individual, going here, there, and everywhere in order to pull the pieces you need at any given time. So if you can have a single uh, core repository or data commons, uh, then, then uh, you really empowers more efficient uh, and effective use of the data. So specifically, the kind of the foundation of what we're doing at LifeOmic is building what we call the Precision Health Cloud. So a cloud-based platform for large-scale clinical research, clinical trials, and healthcare delivery. So uh, empowering everybody, uh, all, all the stakeholders. Um, so a repository, like I said, of all the data, we like to use standards wherever possible. So using the, the, the FHIR standards for clinical data management and, and transfer. Uh, GA4GH is a consortium that's dedicated to, uh, to developing standards for genomic uh, data exchange and, and querying through APIs. Um, so our software all has, you know, very, uh, you know, access control role-based uh, to, to a very fine, fine grained. Uh, and a mobile software development kit. Um, the data are all indexed so that you can rapidly query the data that come into the system. So we kind of go through it every which way to make sure that you can uh, not just have these, you know, gigabyte, multi-gigabyte size files, uh, but you can readily grab the pieces that you need out of it. Everything's based on REST APIs so that you can, um, uh, you can run everything through these uh, uh, mobile, uh, mobile apps, web browsers, uh, smart watches, whatever. Uh, and of course, uh, extensible uh, every way we can think of. So getting back to our, our, our purpose, so our, our first customer, our first project is working uh, with IU on their uh, multi-year, multi-million dollar precision health initiative. So one of these grand challenges. Um, so the, the, uh, the vision for the PHI uh, is to position IU among the leading universities in understanding and optimizing the prevention, onset, treatment, progression, and health outcomes of human disease through precise definition of the genetic, developmental, behavioral, environmental factors that contribute to an individual's health. So that's nice and grand. Uh, so if we get down into specifics, uh, what does this entail? Longitudinal lifetime approach to health. Take all the data, uh, put it together and, and, and make use of it that way. Integrating new data as they become available. So if you uh, are able to sequence a genome, great, let's tie that in. Exposome, so all the individual environmental factors that contribute to what takes your individual uh, based on the DNA you inherited and the life you grew up in, but all those factors that add together to define uh, when you get disease uh, and how it manifests. Uh, an individualized therapy that's well known in, in cancer, which is where the, uh, the, first, uh, the first projects going on with the PHR are focused on. Um, so getting the, the right drug to the right patient at the right time and right dose. Uh, and uh, sharing of data. Uh, disease focused, like I said, these initial three projects are all in cancer. So triple negative breast cancer, pediatric sarcomas and multiple myeloma, and with more to come. So we're working with uh, different investigators uh, uh, through, through the whole IUH uh, system uh, to, and IUSM to, uh, to, to pull these projects together and figure out what is it that really will it really take to move these things forward. It's complex. So here is where Regenstrief has been uh, coming in. Uh, so how do we get data over to LifeOmic here on the far right? 
Well, there's data coming in from multiple sources, such as REDCap project data or data from the enterprise uh, data warehouse. So that's the, the, the data from, uh, from the Cerner um, uh, medical records. So it, it's a lot of processing to, to clean those up, put these in, transform them into these uh, fire resources, uh, gather them together, reconcile, dedupe, et cetera. And, and then to uh, pass those into our system, where our system, through our APIs, can then uh, grab the right information and structure them, index, et cetera. But it gets even more complicated, right? So we don't just have, want to have data coming in from a couple sources. Uh, there's data from the biorepository, uh, data from Eskenazi and their, their EPIC uh, EMR. So how do we get all these things together? Data coming from the various labs uh, around the school and university and hospitals. Um, so ultimately, these data come in. There uh, uh, th a lot of staging done through uh, Regan Streep's effort. So working with uh, tons of people up on the third floor, and uh, to, to then be able to have the data presented through our subject viewer, build cohorts, uh, do all sorts of analytical applications, plumb the knowledge base, add to the knowledge base. And uh, thank you for to Bill Barnett for sharing a few slides that I was able to incorporate there. So let's step back to the, the, the PHC, Precision Health Cloud. So like I said, and you see here, um, the, the fire standards, the GA4, GH standards through REST APIs. So that's kind of the core of what we're talking about. And then you need to, you need to secure that. So we have HIPAA, of course. High trust certification, that's an industry standard that covers uh, you know, to, a checklist of 250 different tests to say, are you doing everything right? Can we all agree that we are? And uh, this is, this is a, a, a very strong focus uh, at Lifeomic, like I mentioned. Uh, our, I think it was employee number nine. Uh, it was our, our chief information security officer. We hired him from, uh, from Fidelity, where he had a team of, of, uh, of 40 people plus. So he came to do things from scratch here. And we were able to get this high trust certification in, uh, in basically record time. Uh, those 250 tests, we passed every single one of those without any remediation necessary. So now that we have that secure system, let's put data in. All the omic data, the EMR data, medical images, et cetera. But what's it for? It's for clinicians and it's for researchers. Different means of access, different tools for accessing it. Uh, for making use of it, but also for the patients. So patients may want to have the ability to access information that's on the PHC. They may be pushing data into the PHC. In fact, they already are. We have uh, a mobile app that just went, uh, just went live on the App Store at Apple. So if you have an iPhone, you could download our Life Fasting Tracker app. Uh, it's, it's a uh, social tool for uh, creating circles of friends, family. Uh, if you wanted to bring in a, uh, somebody on your medical coaching staff, you could uh, to, to help incentivize uh, healthy behaviors uh, such as intermittent fasting, uh, which there are other people at the company who would love to tell you that's, that's another whole lecture. Uh, but the data that people, when they're using that, that app on their iPhone, their data are going on to the PHC onto that same platform up on Amazon Web Services that the clinical data, genomic data are coming in for the Precision Health Initiative. It's a multi-tenant system and, uh, and it all fits together. So we're trying to leverage that, that same platform infrastructure. So not just your phones, but your wearables. So we have a prototype where that, that fasting app can also be running on your, uh, a slightly different version, running on your, on your watch. So you can, on your watch, say, I'm gonna start my fast now. Goes into the system, that records on your phone and other connected devices. So your Fitbit or the, uh, the, the medical uh, monitoring that happens on an Apple Watch. And I'll uh, go into a detail details later. A lot of data, uh, data management. So genomics is a rather specialized field. 
Um, so that's one of the specialties that Lifeomic is bringing to, to, to the table, to uh, joining with Regan Street's expertise in, in the clinical data. So there are uh, public uh, knowledge bases. Uh, there are uh, public and private large data sets that can be brought in. Uh, there may be specific knowledge coming in from particular um, from a, a particular uh, uh, enterprise or customer. Uh, the data are indexed, harmonized, and ultimately uh, all comes out uh, the other end and, and can be used. So taking a specific example, variants in the genome, the human genome, uh, three billion bases long. It's big. There are hundreds of millions of variants that are known. Many are common, many are rare, many are unique to an individual. Everybody in the room has their own specific set of mutations that uh, may have never existed in anybody in the history of time. Um, but a lot of them have. So when you put a genome in, you want to know what's known about this. So we catalog all this information, reconcile it. And so this graphic is just to show that when you take information from, uh, say, a couple clinical repositories, ClinVar focuses on the inherited genome, Cosmic on uh, cancer mutations. And you can see there's actually quite a bit of overlap there. When you sequence a, a tumor, you're also sequencing the, the germline, the, the DNA you were born with. But so you have millions of variants uh, all together. Then population level data coming in from multiple data sets. And this uh, Venn diagram is just to indicate that uh, every time you add a new database, yes, there's overlap, but there's always unique data coming. So once you have all this data, you can query and analyze it uh, in many different dimensions. We have a, an analytics team, uh, machine learning experts, uh, and uh, they've been building up some marvelous tools, hooking up uh, publicly available tools. Uh, so you can be uh, querying based on uh, clinical demographics, your genetics, uh, history, et cetera. Uh, using uh, the machine learning, like I mentioned, uh, clustering algorithms, uh, AI, deep learning, uh, anything you want to throw at. Uh, just a couple of slides to point out that you can also tie in other tools that you're maybe familiar with working with. This is our studio. And so through our API access, you can connect in, draw the data into our studio and analyze it. Here's Spotfire. So another, another set of tools, great for visualization and uh, 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 plumbing through the data. Here's a, an example of what a, a project might look like. Here we have this breast cancer study with uh, multiple patients and data coming in from the clinical side through fire. So the, the uh, radiology, your clinical observations, your, uh, uh, your cholesterol levels, et cetera. Uh, genetics, so DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, expression data, proteomics. And, uh, and then the, the social data. So this is where you could bring in those, uh, that exposome information. Uh, again, the indexing, the big data analytics, you can put it all together. So at this point, I'm going to uh, shift over into some uh, live demos. And uh, today, what I'm going to show you are a couple projects. Uh, the first one is, is kind of a, is a synthetic study uh, on uh, an, a uh, type 2, a missing D there, so a type 2 diabetes study. Um, uh, and I'll show off our, our patient viewer, so where you can really drill down into an individual subject and, uh, and, and think about how, uh, what they're experiencing and how you might uh, manage their, uh, their health and their, and their ill health. Uh, and then a large scale um, real data study on breast cancer, uh, coming, data coming in from the Cancer Genome Atlas, a large public study. Uh, and just a little plug tomorrow, we have a, another uh, two hour session set aside tomorrow morning where we're going to be uh, going into detail on some of these machine learning options. Uh, and the ability to uh, use uh, Docker containers, so bits of code that you wrap up and can run them through our task service. So you can run not just some uh, short, uh, some kind of quick turnaround uh, analyses, but also things that may run for uh, hours or days and then get the results back. Uh, and, uh, and again, the RStudio and Spotfire integrations. Uh, before I go to switch over to the demo, I, I should have said at the outset, I'd be happy to take any questions, uh, any, anything at this point. You, you're curious about? Yes. On this slide earlier, were you showing all of the different kind of inputs? Um, I'm not sure if that was hypothetical or actual, but I didn't notice any registries in there that might be part of a device registry or tumor registry. Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. There are um, lovely re repositories out there. These these registries, I think, those are. Um, 
it, it would certainly work, and I think that's a, a great idea for how you could leverage the capabilities of our platform to make full use of a registry or, you know, query it in the context of the study that you're involved in. So, uh, of, of course, whenever you're trying to tie into anything like this, you have to go through certain uh, uh, legal contractual things and, and uh, make sure all of that happens. Uh, there was uh, quite a bit, quite a bit that was uh, necessary in order to establish this clean relationship that we have now. Um, just a few months ago, we didn't have that in place. But uh, essentially, you know, we're a HIPAA HIPAA compliant uh, trained organization. We've got uh, BAA with Regenstrief, who has it in turn uh, with uh, the the uh, school of medicine and with the uh, uh, the, the hospitals, um, so that we can have that those transactions take place. So the same kind of operations, uh, I would presume, would be necessary for a registry. But that's that's a, a great idea. Uh, in fact, I know we're talking to at least uh, one of the large um, uh, societies that are interested in, in some of these widespread diseases uh, for that, that same kind of application. All right, so let me try to uh, switch over here. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so like I said, this is all API driven, REST APIs. We're just calling this from a web browser. So here I am in Chrome and I'm going to access our system. And I think the login is going to proceed. Uh, it didn't even ask me for my my credentials um, uh, because uh, I've I've got a password manager in place. Um, but we have uh, we have a single sign-on, so people can use uh, participants in the uh, in the PHI studies. Uh, so the users on the system can use their IU uh, credentials in order to log into the system. So we could set that up with anybody's. Um, anybody's authorization system. Uh, there's a lot of management that you can do here. I mentioned that before, the access controls, uh, assignment of roles. The, the general structure of work here you know, on the platform is project-based. So we have several projects set up here in this, uh, in this environment. And I'll walk through a couple of these, like I mentioned. Um, but so users have been assigned to these, each with their own roles. Uh, An administrator controls that. So we, uh, right now, for the PHIs, the projects that are being set up are on, being run under IRBs. So only those individuals who are have, have the uh, authorized access will be uh, able to get in, in there and work with the data. Um, so this uh, this. Uh, first study that's highlighted right now, this breast cancer research, so we can see a description that I've written in there, or one of my colleagues did rather. We can see how much data are in the system, so we have uh, about 12, uh, 11 or 12 gigs of file storage and some database storage as well. Uh, but right now what I'm going to do is switch over to our type 2 diabetes study and uh, flip over, actually let's go, well, let's go to a subject list. So we can see here that we have 570 uh, subjects participating in this trial. And uh, let's, let's look at some, some insights on this. So just uh, some demographic summaries, so we can see their age uh, breakdown. So most of them are in their 50s, uh, a, a typical kind of US mixture of racial background, 50-50 uh, uh, gender ratio. And uh, these uh, patients are fortunately all alive. Um, then let's go back to our subjects. So what I want to do is focus in on an individual right now. So I happen to know the name of Lavelle Vandervoort. And uh, we're going to click into here and uh, see some information about her. So we have a timeline. Uh, so where we could use this to focus in on a particular date range if we wanted. And uh, that we can see some information that's already available on her. So here we have data coming in from multiple sources. So first, this is um, this this uh, diabetes studies is actually a drug study. So we have an intervention of this trial drug being uh, the the patient starts taking this back in January, and we can see what happened over the past uh, handful of months since she went on drug. Uh, we can see that her glucose levels started to get more under control and also her pain. Um, so the glucose may be coming from a continuous glucose monitoring device where the data are being fed into the platform. Uh, pain is being measured by a survey that, that uh, she's uh, doing either on a website or on her mobile device. Uh, so she can go through the checklist of scores and we can see how she's feeling from day to day. 
Uh, and we can see that uh, uh, in addition to uh, kind of the direct uh, direct signs of the of the di diabetic nephropathy and and uh, and uh, uh, blood sugar management, uh, that she's also lost a lost a few pounds. And uh, we can see the data coming in from her Fitbit. We can see that uh, her uh, she's been a little bit more active, increasing her her walking day to day. And um, uh, she's also recording how much meditation she's doing, as well as um, uh, a record of her exercise. So everything's looking encouraging there. Now, what uh, we can also do is take a look at some genetics. So here are variants, and this is actually a subset of a very long list of variants that are, uh, we've subsetted this down to ones that are uh, relevant to disease and disease management uh, for the study. Um, but this is the same kind of display that we might have on any other study where you're looking at, in this case, uh, germline DNA. And we can see that these are a set of variants where she's heterozygous. She has a different uh, copy from mother and father. Uh, most of these are missense variants, so they're changing the protein in some way. And uh, we have access to kind of the uh, ready access to the world's information. So if you weren't familiar with that gene, you could uh, click the little uh, link. And again, we're in a web browser. So up in another tab, uh, we're going out to uh, the NIH and their uh, information about this gene. We can also go uh, specifically into this variant. Sometimes you want to make sure that that quality is good. So we have access here to the, um, to the raw data from the sequencers. Remember, this is 3 billion bases sequenced to an average uh, of about um, uh, a depth of 30. So basically 30 times over, you're sequencing these kind of roughly evenly distributed across the genome. So we can open up that variant just, just to make sure that this does match up. Uh, there's a lot of clever informatics that goes on in genetics to take uh, these, you know, uh, millions upon millions of, of, of small reads of about a 100, 200 bases long from the DNA and kind of mapping them all together like a, like a big jigsaw puzzle. And so we can see all of these individual reads lined up and uh, just like we were in, say, uh, uh, Google Maps or something, we could we could be, oops, been a little sluggish here, but we could um, drag around and see this. This particular view is not something that we've built at Lifeomic. Uh, this is uh, the integrative genome viewer developed at the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, um, but they have, there's tons of information available about these variants. And what we can see here, we can see kind of half of the, half of these reads is what they're called. Half of them are showing up with a little green mark. Uh, and half of them are gray. The gray meaning it's uh, represented the, the same as in the reference genome. Uh, so the, the general human reference genome, the backbone on which everything's measured. Uh, and the other half are green, so that's the variant. So we have about 50-50, what you'd expect, one from mom, one from dad. Um, so uh, back to our patient, I, I'm going to show you one other view. You can, you can establish multiple views. Actually, just to point out, this is all editable. So I can hit the edit graph here. If we wanted, we could go in and we could, uh, you know, change the, uh, change the style of this. You know, we could, um, uh, you know, we, we could change the, 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 the width of the line or the colors just to make it, uh, make it as, as uh, satisfying as you want. Uh, potentially, some of these could be turned into, you know, bar charts and uh, pie charts, and, and it's uh, very flexible. Um, here, you know, it's a single, uh, a, a single measurement. So this is pulling data from those fire resources to tie this back to our technology here. Um, so the data is all stored in fire. Uh, the genomic data, some of that's in fire. Other broader data is, is in uh, large raw data files. Uh, we could also resize these if we wanted, you know, so just simple adjustments. Uh, we could add or subtract modules into this, so we could add some, some tables of the, the raw observation data. And when you're done with that, you can, you can save that configuration. Um, if you wanted, you could, you could uh, send that and share that with another user. You could establish that as the default for a project. Um, but when we're done editing, we lock that down, and now that view is available for other patients. So I wanted to show you a, a, another view that we have into um, uh, this same patient, so where we can access uh, information about, say, uh, the uh, individual data about the, uh, the drugs that this patient was on. Um, and uh, uh, other media. So I mentioned bringing in image data. So these, uh, so we have simple things like this JPEG of, of a mammogram. 
uh, or here's some these four DICOM images from a, a renal study. So we can uh, take one of these files, open it up in this uh, viewer. So again, this is this is not a tool that we've developed at Lifeomic, but a, an open source uh, tool that we are able to connect in. And so you can see there's uh, multiple slices through this image, and we can just kind of zoom around. We can pan in and out. Uh, we could even say make a measurement. So how big is that that kidney? Um, and uh, if if the metadata were in place on this file, this would actually be putting a measurement on there, just like if you were going from a, a fetal ultrasound during pregnancy. So just to show off some of the versatility of this. So now what I'd like to do is take us to a different project. So let's move on to our breast cancer research. So here is this uh, data from the Cancer Genome Atlas I mentioned before. So here we have over a thousand patients who have come in. So we have uh, data on uh, gene expression as well as, as uh, the somatic variants, so the, the mutations in the cancer. Uh, again, we can see the demographics here, uh, as you might expect, it's mostly women, but there are some, some men in this breast cancer data set. Um, we can look at expression. So in, in real time, this is going up to Amazon Web Services, grabbing the data from these expression data files. Uh, it's specifically subset here to a list of, of 50 genes that are known to be uh, relevant in, uh, in understanding breast cancer. And uh, it's created this heat map uh, with a clustering by the, across these 50 genes on the y-axis and on the x-axis clustering the samples based on, on similarity. Uh, another analysis that was run and now displayed for us is this principal components analysis, uh, where uh, intriguingly uh, it has in fact uh, noticed that there are a couple different kinds of patients in here it seems. Uh, so on this, uh, this uh, first axis uh, over here on the right we can see two colors. Uh, the blue, the majority of the patients, and in orange, the triple negative breast cancer patients. So a particular, uh, a particular subset of patients as, as defined by some, uh, some hormone levels and uh, other gene expression levels. And we can look at the genes individually. Uh, if we wanted, we can zoom in. It's the beauty of, of tying in uh, these graphics libraries that are available out there, and we can look at the individuals uh, within this population. Um, so then how about looking at the individual, uh, let, let's say we wanted to investigate uh, how feasible a study might be. So if I'm say a drug company or I'm an academic researcher and I want to, uh, I, I want to see, are, are there enough patients going through my hospital system that I'm going to be able to uh, en enroll uh, enough patients over the course of two years to, to make this study worthwhile? Um, or just to explore the structure of the data. So we can go in here and filter down our subjects. So first, let's, uh, let's narrow this, uh, this cancer set down to, to just the women. Let's focus on only those patients who are still alive. Now we can uh, simply hit the search button. We can see there are 1,097, so we've dropped off about 100 patients. Uh, but we can get into the clinical information as well here. So let's take those who are at a somewhat more advanced uh, stage of disease. Let's uh, do the estrogen receptor positive or HER2, to, uh, HER2 negatives. Um, we could filter by age if we wanted. Uh, let's go in here and choose the medication history. So let's just focus on those who have been uh, taking tamoxifen. Okay, so we could do this. And I think now we should end up with, yeah, a little over 100 patients. So far, so good. You know, we're, 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 getting, we're getting a reasonable sample size here, it seems. But now, just to point out that we're, we can get into the genetics as well. Remember, these are data that are coming from totally different sources. The genetics aren't in Cerner. You can't access this in any way through your um, th through the records of the um, uh, of, of the uh, EMR uh, systems. Uh, but if we tie this together, now we can. So I want to have patients who have mutations in a particular couple of genes, so uh, P10 or uh, PIK3CA. So a couple well-known cancer genes. And, um, uh, and if I wanted, I could specify the kinds of mutations. If I wanted, I could specify an individual mutation that I wanted to see. Um, but we hit search, and now our 100 are down to 40 patients. 
And so we could we could take that information and say, okay, I've got ones who have this the correct genetic uh, profile uh, that this is this is going to be a, a good uh, a good study set for me. And from what I understand, talking to the uh, to the uh, cancer uh, c clinicians around here, this is these are requests that they get weekly. You know, they get interested people who are there are all these uh, drug companies out there who are investigating new cancer drugs, new combination therapies, new regimens, new formulations, and they want to figure out, uh, can I can, can I enlist patients from the IU health system? Can I can I is, is it worthwhile establishing a uh, some clinical recruitment from here? Uh, can I go to, can I, do you have historical patients? I might be able to do some kind of, if we can get the appropriate consents, to go back and do a little retrospective analysis to, to see whether this, this is going to be useful. Um, so with this tool, we're going to be able to do this. Uh, and uh, those, those permissions are, are, have now gotten in place. So pretty soon, those uh, data are going to start flowing in. Um, so uh, just uh, one more view on this. Uh, so there, I, I mentioned. Um, so this is kind of a kind of a can set of, of filters that are available. They've been tailored to this particular study. But if we if we wanted, we could access the full power of of the APIs of this complex uh, analytics API, where we could be constructing a more complicated set of of questions as opposed to just the simple built-in ands and ors. So here, uh, I've just written a, a, a query. Um, where I'm focusing in on uh, trying to uh, get a set of patients, uh, where we have um, both uh, variants that are in a certain gene, or, so I've got an or here, uh, or in this other gene, but in this other gene, P10, they have to be nonsense. These have to be variants that are knocking out the function of that gene. Whereas in PIK3CA, I'm willing to take uh, any kind of mutation. So that's not something you could do in the other filter. Um, so you could create a real complex query, and then, uh, in fact, just to kind of show you uh, another way of looking at it. So it's actually in the background that's constructing this JSON uh, object, which which is actually what is executed to uh, to then uh, generate our results. Um, so I can execute our query, goes out to those data objects. And we can find out that we have 301 patients that uh, that met those criteria. So uh, we're we're trying to give different ways for the researchers and clinicians to access the data any which way they want. So those are the uh, the, the basics of of what I wanted to demo today. Um, uh, just as a little teaser for tomorrow, since I have a few minutes. Um, the machine learning. So machine learning, you know, there's, it's, it's very popular out there, especially you start getting into the uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning paradigm. Uh, so these kind of tools are available here. So you can establish a set of data. Um, so drawing on, say, that same breast cancer project, but rather than look at all of it kind of unprocessed, kind of a, a key thing that from what, I, from what I hear is kind of an over, a, a lot of, 90% of the work in these studies is actually cleaning up the data, normalizing the data, getting them prepared to put into those, those fancy algorithms. Uh, so you can go in here, you can run a PCA uh, to, or, or some of these other routines to uh, extract a limited number of features, uh, kind of the main vectors of information through the variability in the data set. Um, so we could set that up using, as you can see, lots of other options. Once you have your, your data frame cleaned up, you can create a model. So here's one that's already been run. This was focused on uh, looking for a gene expression uh, uh, a model, uh, a pattern of, of gene expression that would predict triple negative breast cancer cases. Uh, and after this was run, we have about a 93% uh, overall accuracy. It was targeting classification. So looking at a binary yes, no, I'm predicting this to be uh, diseased or not, or to have that particular subclass of disease. And uh, the algorithm was run was a random forest machine learning technique uh, with certain parameter settings. Um, but just to, this is this is a large library that we've been assembling. Um, so again, we're we're choosing uh, choosing our data frame. So we're going to say we wanted to look at the gene expression data. We want to tr uh, train it for that one was classification. We could be using regression or an unsupervised technique. Uh, we can set our splits. Um, so how much did the data do you train on versus you uh, you use to test it? 
um, you know, what kind of accuracy, what kind of measure of success are you after? And then choose your algorithm. So uh, I mentioned deep learning. Uh, that's the kind of the kind of tools that are being used to to find, you know, show me all the all the pictures of puppy dogs uh, out on Google Images. Um, uh, and so you can you know train these neurons. This is based on a on on a you know, it's artificial intelligence, right? So it's based on on the the brain. And uh, again, set all your things. And finally, you end up with a set of of predictions. And if we went back to those filters. Um, so I won't go through this full exercise, but we could say, okay, I've run my model. Now I want to see all the ones that came up positive um, on that. So show me those. Well, maybe I will hit run. Uh, and so we get out the list of 21 patients who are predicted to have that triple negative status. And so that's a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, we've, been, we've been busy. Uh, and uh, I would love to take your questions. All right, let's open it up for questions. I'm sure there's many. You might have to start us off, Peter. Or, Actually, I have a question. So the views that you were showing earlier initially, the, the, the diabetes project, for example. Yes. So that is set up as a visualization to only be limited to those things that that project has specified I'm going to show, correct? Like you couldn't right. say... You know, I, I want to also add in something else. So I, I, I was trying to sort of, did you have to pre-specify all of those things you wanted to be in that project or for demo purposes, that's just sort of how you So the, the data are kind of uh, under the covers, right? So that all the data that came in are stored as those fire objects or data files, et cetera. And so when you are creating that project, you may be setting up one or more views so that you have the, your, your tailored way of looking at it. Um, so I believe if I actually take uh, here, I'm in that that uh, breast cancer study. If I open this up, it, it's here. It is actually trying to apply that same that same layout that we saw for the diabetes study to the to the breast cancer patient. It's not really working. There's nothing there. Um, so, but if I wanted, I could go in and edit that and say, you know, okay, I, I don't want that at all. Uh, let's get rid of that. Um, and uh, no, it's not weight that I want, so let's go in here and I could rename it and I could say, uh, I could put in the observation code. So this is the, the, the record, so like a low ink code. Um, we're going to have other tools for getting at this. So you could say, you know, I want to see uh, all of the different um, cholesterol levels. Um, so choose a node and now it'll, it'll stack up a bunch of cholesterol levels or show the set of medications. Um, uh, let's see, I could be plotting multiple as one. I'm going to see if I add another trace. Uh, let's see. These are doing the multiple here. Um, trace types, right? So I could be adding in um, the, the DNA, uh, the, the, the conditions, so the diagnoses, the uh, ICD-10s, et cetera, um, the physician encounters, procedures, medications, observations. So you could uh, mix and match, pick whatever you want and put it in. Good. Well, um, one of the things that um, where my head goes, just thinking about what I know to be the expertise in the room and, and your expertise is how we can identify even more opportunities. Clearly, we're already working together, as you pointed out, in the Precision Health Initiative with a lot of development and then application of these kinds of solutions to that particular initiative. But there's so much more potential here. Um, so even at the level of, 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 let's say, the app that you all have just developed or the development of other kinds of apps, but where my head goes is so many of these apps that exist and solutions that exist really have very little, if any, evidence behind them, right, in terms of their actual impact on care and right. outcomes. Uh, and that's really, I think, one of the exciting opportunities we have in this collaboration. So as you think about that, as you think about where you are in your development process and the kinds of solutions you have and how ready they are for further testing in real-world populations, how do you think about the potential for us to work together? And I'm, uh, I have my thoughts on that, but I'm wondering where, how you think about Great. it. Great. Yeah. No, I, I, th I think that would be terrific. So uh, just just to mention an an example, a specific example that comes to mind. Right now, we have our our mobile app, the 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 life fasting tracker I mentioned earlier. It's gathering a very limited amount of data right now. So it's you know the, your your history of fasting and your moods. So that's not much. So I, I didn't mention that when you're in the app, you can say, yeah, okay, I've been fasting for five hours and I'm doing, I'm doing fine. Uh, but then you could uh, change your status and say, man, I'm, I'm starving or I feel great. Uh, and your friends actually get a notification of that. But all of that is recorded. 
and it's recorded down in the PhD. And you can send each other little notes of encouragement too. You can keep going, keep going. Um, so, but that's that's a record of information that's there. So, uh, so you could, but that's already some data. Uh, there's another layer of data that's in there, right? So I mentioned that it's social. So people construct these circles of, of friends who are kind of fasting together, who are, uh, you, you could, you, I, I could imagine questions and we, we've already spoken internally of some of this. Uh, in fact, one of our one of our staff members is a PhD sociologist. Uh, she's She's got all sorts of ideas for, for what you could do with this. So, uh, but just imagining a simple question about the utility of an intervention. So there's the, the fasting itself, right? So is that actually, um, are you getting better at it? Do you, you not feel as, as hungry uh, uh, later on? Uh, maybe you, we will be tying in some, uh, your, your weight information, et cetera, your activity levels. Um, but what about just how, how successful are you at sticking to your goals? You're, you're trying to do these 16 hour fasts and you often give up. But maybe if you're in a circle, so you could be there just as an individual, but maybe you're in a circle of a few people, maybe you're in a circle of 50. You could, maybe there's a sweet spot in there that, you know, oh, it's that, you know, that cluster of five uh, who, who really, who, it's, it's the right number. You're not overwhelmed by everybody, uh, but you're not on your own either. So that's, that, you could take those data, you could, you could uh, do some kind of uh, studies on them. Uh, or I was talking to uh, another one of your uh, uh, colleagues here just yesterday uh, about, uh, about uh, weight management, uh, so help, helping these uh, obese patients with their um, uh, tr trying to get that under control. And uh, the question of whether, whether encouragement works uh, uh, and the thought of, of a social aspect of that and whether that could be beneficial. Yeah, that's really helpful. And, and for those who don't, uh, who aren't as familiar with that particular literature, there's a growing literature on the potential health benefits of fasting, which is really what this is built upon. I think the, um, but I think you're right. I think the the platform and the capabilities where you're now basically able to produce these solutions that can traffic in not only the kinds of data that are increasingly collected on our wearables and our devices, but also bring in um, other kinds of data from the clinical and genomic and other sorts of spaces presents us with really interesting opportunities to apply to a lot of what we're doing and potentially be able to sort of study the impacts of that. The ability to have a group like yourselves who we're working so closely with to quickly generate an app like that and a solution for the kinds of problems that we're thinking about addressing um, and having these kinds of capabilities, I think, presents a lot of, a lot of interesting opportunities. Even now, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about um, the data themselves. So, so one of the things, and you've mentioned privacy and, and, and issues that are obviously fundamental and they come up. So, um, you know, when somebody signs up for this, you have the potential now to capture a whole lot of information, right? A lot of information about those individuals uh, and potentially combine that, I would imagine, with permissions um, in, in terms of uh, combining that with other kinds of, of data and information we have about them. If we, if we were to deploy this to a population of people in which we had clinical data and we got the right permissions in place, what is it that you're currently able to do with those data? To what extent could our investigators start to query the data uh, of the users of the app, what, what is the current uh, permission sort of profile there, and what can we do with that? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a terrific question that I should know the answer to, um, but I, I I'm not working as much on that on that side. Does uh, anybody in the back know? So I have a number of, of colleagues here from Life Home. Actually, would you guys raise your hands because uh, they're they're fair game to uh, come talk to you afterwards. Does anybody know what the uh, kind of uh, uh, data privacy opt-in research kind of uh, things there might be in the uh, user agreement on the, on the Life app? Yes. Um, I'm not sure of that. I don't know if it's a public iteration, but I think it, I think it allows us to do research on the data, but to anonymize fashion, so it's a public uh, I think that's what it's like. Yeah. Yeah, another thing we've talked about doing is, is having, uh, you know, informed consent, uh, you know, through these apps. Um, but uh, opt-in and opt-out options are all things to consider for a particular purpose. Hello, I had a question about, um, I guess kind of in that same vein, um, looking at 
would you be able to look at clusters of maybe like um, specific characteristics or geographic populations, like where there's clusters of certain diseases? Um, and then even for that matter, talking about the social aspect, would you able, be able to see who's in one area? Maybe they can form a group in that area, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, geographic information is, is certainly a, a possibility to look at. In fact, I think if, uh, uh, no, I better not fiddle. Uh, I know we had a la latitude and longitude fields in there, believe it or not, um, uh, for, for some of the patients. Uh, I, I know uh, with the uh, work that Regan Streif had, had done for uh, another version of the patient viewing uh, for these, uh, for the PHI studies was in fact a summary view where you didn't just have overall demographics, age distribution, et cetera. Um, but actually uh, put, put up a, a map of Indiana and the surrounding uh, states and county by county or zip code by zip code plotting um, where those patients were from. Um, so you could absolutely access that data, display the data, and there are you know, geographical uh, uh, kind of machine learning uh, data, data science techniques that can be applied to look for clusters. Um, it goes to, to like the, uh, we were talking about exposure earlier. So uh, you know, the epidemiologists are all, all over that kind of analysis. And that's a field that's been around a long time. So certainly those kinds of things could be hooked up. Sean. Hey, Ben. We We've had some conversations with your team previously, not only about PHI work, but also about just research in general. And I'm wondering the extent to which you all have continued to think through what those workflows and processes might look like. If I think there's a general process of saying, hey, have some data, would like to maybe integrate it, aggregate it, do some analysis on it. And it seems like maybe the platform would make the most sense to your platform would make the most sense. Are you all thinking through developing a process? Are you still kind of in the nascent early stages? You're talking about how somebody would approach us to to, to create a study on the system to, yeah, to, to become a, involved? Yeah, so I the, the platform is sort of, it's a data integration and yeah. analytics platform, which is kind of a generalizable, reusable thing. And I can imagine, you know, there's a number of people here and throughout the building who who leverage data to perform research and analyses. So I'm wondering if I came and said, hey, I have a data set for this particular project that I need to apply random forest mm -hmm. um, machine learning algorithms to. How could I leverage your, your platform to do that? Here's my data, what do I do? And I imagine there at least eventually would be a framework that would emerge for the processes one might go through to use that. I'm just curious right. whether you all, where you all are in that. I know that when we spoke earlier, it was in the beginning stages of that conversation. I didn't know if there's been you know, some, any further yeah, that, steps? No, that, that's great. Like, like, like I mentioned, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations around IUSM, et cetera, um, about things that people, people are sitting on data and they don't have great ways to access it and they, or, or ways to analyze it and they'd like to get going. Um, there are questions about, uh, I, I guess, just to make sure that the legalities are in place, that the data can go into the platform. Um, and so I, a lot of that's unfortunately that's going to be conversational uh, and we'll, we, we did, until we dig in and find the answers. Uh, th there, there is the question of, of, of budgetary uh, issues, right? So I think you know this is this work right now is being uh, f funded in part through uh, investment by R Regan Streif and uh, and the, the PHI. Uh, some of that will be uh, paying for some of these resources that are being used on 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 Amazon, et cetera. Um, so I, I don't know. Not everything would fall under PHI. Uh, so we might have to explore whether there's grants. I, I know uh, we, we've we've uh, sat around the table and talked about potential grants uh, that you might be putting in, um, or where there's money set aside for analysis, uh, and where you know, and you could you know direct it towards uh, supporting a, a little work on this instead of uh, some other approach. Um, but it's first place to to the, the way to get going is just to say hi and uh, let's talk about talk about what you're doing, what you're interested in doing. Hey, Ben. Here. Where are you? Oh, right hey, here. Stephen. Um, I saw one of the metrics you had for the random forest outputs were accuracy, but do you guys also output like top features and um, with the random forest, can it help you with dimension reduction as well? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I don't, know, I don't know how you get in right now to access it. It might not be through the UI. 
um, but the data still live on the system. So just to just to point out, I mean, so everything here that you've seen is built on the uh, though those REST APIs drawn up, uh, activated through these through these web browsers. Uh, there you you can actually use a, a command line interface to access the data as well. So if you have the if you're signed in, have the uh, you know the, the the rights to access the data, uh, there be be able to, to query out those those additional results. Um, but ultimately, or longer term, uh, we can build in ways to display that. It's a great question, and uh, you know, I hope you'll be able to make it tomorrow. Uh, we'll, we'll get you the invitation so we can we can delve into those details. Well, thank you. If there are no more questions, another round of applause. Thank you. So much. <laughs>